Good afternoon, and welcome to Sundays in Swanee. My name is Denise Osier, and I'm the Community Partnership and Adult Programming Manager. And we are honored today to host Cloud Conrad and the book, The Dementia Field Guide. Cloud is a certified dementia caregiver trainer working with professional and family caregivers. The Dementia Field Guide addresses two topics and goes much further, providing a practical foundation for caregivers of those living with dementia in care planning, care interaction, and response, and the self-care for caregivers. Following her remarks, there'll be a chance for you to ask your questions and she will answer them, and then she'd be delighted to uh, sell you a copy of her book over there and autograph it for you. Please help me welcome Cloud Conrad. Thank you, Denise. It's an honor to be here this afternoon to talk with you about the very important topic of Alzheimer's and dementia. Our society is um, very deeply affected by Alzheimer's and dementia today, and over time, it will become more affected by Alzheimer's and dementia. The number one risk factor for any kind of dementia is actually age. And so if we plan to age, we may have a higher risk of Alzheimer's or dementia. Uh, the reason that we are seeing so much more Alzheimer's and dementia in our population today is because the baby boomer generation is the largest population cell in the United States. And those in the baby boomer generation were born between 1946 and 1964. So the oldest baby boomers are now turning 75. <clears throat> With so many Americans approaching elder years, 65, 75, 85, we're going to see a lot more dementia than we do today. Today it's estimated that one in five families is affected by dementia. Now that's not one person in every five family has, or every five households, shall we say, has dementia. But between the person living with dementia, their family caregivers, and other family members, um, and in their separate households, then we get to the math that it's one in five households today. However, by the year 2035, just 15 years from now, it's affected, less than 15 years from now, it's expected that we're going to see that number rise to one in two households. Every other house, on your street will have a will be a family affected by dementia staggering numbers right now for those that are age 65 plus one in approximately 20 has some form of dementia for those that are 75 plus and those are those earliest baby boomers one in approximately 10 has some form of dementia and for those 85 plus one in three has some form of dementia African-American communities and populations are uh, more affected than a Caucasian population. For uh, every one Caucasian with dementia, there are two African-Americans. Um, uh, uh, Hispanics are one and a half times more likely than a Caucasian to, uh, to develop dementia in their lifetime. And for females, ladies, <clears throat> for every one male with dementia, there are two of us. And on the caregiver side of things, for every one male family caregiver, unpaid caregiver, friend or relative, for every one male caregiver, there are two females. So this is definitely a, um, dementia is a syndrome actually, not a disease, but this is definitely a syndrome that uh, affects our populations disproportionately. And sadly, there are more people with dementia living in underserved communities and probably not getting the, the type of care that they need um, than there really should be. This is a problem that's being focused on but not yet solved. Uh, because dementia is so prevalent in our society and because it is a uh, disease that tends to affect those that are aging more than those that are not aging, um, and because some of the earliest forms of dementia actually look like normal aging, the, the, the majority of the questions that I receive regarding dementia is, is this a sign of dementia? 
Is that a sign of dementia? Is my forgetfulness something I should worry about or is that normal aging? And that's really what I want to cover with you today. What is normal aging? What is not normal aging? I'm going to go through 30 different signs of cognitive uh, impairment, cognitive decline, so that you can help parse out for yourself or a family member if the signs that you're noticing are cause for concern or if this is indeed normal aging. Our uh, journey today, if you will, um, is to talk about normal aging, um, why cognitive impairment is so difficult to discern early on. We will talk about the signals of cognitive impairment as well, and that's really the meat of our, uh, of our time here together today. Um, we will talk about establishing an, an, a cognitive baseline and the importance of that. And finally, uh, a little bit about what the diagnostic path would look like if uh, a person found themselves on that diagnostic path, either for themselves or for another person. So let's dive right in here. Um, what is normal aging? Normal aging is when we need readers, when our hair turns gray, when we, our skin starts to wrinkle, when we get a little less um, nimble, let's say, than we used to uh, in our younger years. These are all signs of normal aging. We might have some hearing deficit and need some kind of uh, hearing correction or, or vision correction beyond uh, just readers. We might be a little forgetful. We might know someone. We might remember exactly the last conversation we had with them, but we just can't come up with their name. That's probably normal aging. Um, we might miss an appointment from time to time. I might leave my house in the morning uh, getting ready to go for work and I not, not have it on my mind that I have a dentist appointment at 3 o'clock that afternoon. But somewhere during the drive into work or during my, the course of my day, I will remember, oh, Dr. Pate, 3 o'clock this afternoon, and I'll get myself there. A person who does not remember that the dentist appointment was yesterday at 3 o'clock may be showing you a sign of something more serious, something that deserves some attention. Um, there are the Alzheimer's Association, and I do a number of talks for the Alzheimer's Association as well. The Alzheimer's Association offers three different lenses to look through um, these observations about changes you see in yourself or another person. And through these three lenses, we can help to discern whether or not what we're noticing is a normal sign of aging or something that is um, cause for concern. And those three lenses are, and I just gave you one example, uh, if the person is able to recover from the lapse, then it is likely not a cognitive problem. So I was able to recover the fact that I had a dentist appointment this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Not a problem. Um, if I am at the grocery store and I run into my high school, my daughter's high school teacher, her favorite teacher, so someone I had a lot of interaction with over time, and I, I see her at the far end of the aisle and we're pushing our buggies next to each other, and, uh, towards each other, and I'm thinking, what's her name? What's her name? What is her name? We have the conversation. We obviously remember who we are. It's not until I'm driving home that I realize her name is Jan. Her name is Jan, able to recover. Um, so, uh, and then the third one is, uh, is the lapse something that is um, simply an inconvenient senior moment? Or is it something that is happening so frequently now that it is affecting daily life? So, oh, the, the, the other one that I didn't um, tell you. Um, different from before, different for that person. So the three are, if the person's able to recover from their memory lapse, not a problem, normal aging. Um, if, it's, if, it, if, the person is, um, um, if the person is having problems that are different from before and different for that person, then that could be cause for concern. But if the behavior has been going on for decades and decades, um, then not cause for concern. What is an example of that? If I have never been good at balancing my checkbook, the fact that I bounced a check last month is not cause for concern. If I had been meticulous with my checkbook or the housekeeping, for example, and now all of a sudden I'm having problems balancing my checkbook or keeping up with the housekeeping or personal grooming, that could be cause for concern. So to put it the other way, to say these could be cause for concern if a person has the inability to recover, if a person, it's happening so frequently that it's affecting daily life, or if it's different from before, and different for that person, then it could be cause for concern. Normal aging, I listed out what normal aging was. 
Uh, we talked about that occasional word loss, um, forgetfulness, slower to process thoughts, some moodiness, um, and then maybe um, uh, less social engagement, uh, loss of muscle strength. For example, handwriting typically becomes a little harder to read as we age, and that is because of dexterity issues. Um, uh, difficulty with um, motor skills, and um, you know, like not being able to run anymore, or not being able to walk as quickly, the shuffling of the feet, vision correction and, and hearing correction as well. So normal aging is not, and this is what we just talked about, um, changes that are consistently different for that person, changes that uh, affect daily living, and then changes or lapses from which a person cannot recover. Why is it so difficult to, um, to discern normal aging from not normal aging? One reason is that um, aging happens so slowly that the changes that occur from day to day, um, we, uh, loved ones and even the individual that it's happening to tend to adjust and create a new normal. Uh, and so we don't have, we lose the ability to, to recognize a baseline from day to day when the changes are happening so slowly. Um, also, people are able to recover. They're able to compensate. The brain is such an amazing organ um, that it will compensate when one area of the brain is, is having a moment, let's say, uh, another part of the brain will pick up. And uh, we know this, um, you, we hear stories about people that become blind and their hearing becomes much more acute than it ever was, or vice versa. Um, a, a person loses their hearing and their sight becomes much more acute than it used to be. That's to help um, in self-preservation. We are put on this earth to preserve ourselves so we can uh, procreate um, the next generation and generations and generations. And so our, our body and our brain is particularly geared towards self-preservation. And that compensation can actually disguise some signs of aging that are not um, normal. And then another reason that it's very difficult um, to discern normal from not normal uh, is denial. This is such a daunting topic. And it is so easy for us and our loved ones to deny, uh, um, well, I lose my keys too, so my sister's not having a problem. Or if she's having a problem, then that means I'm having a problem because I lose my keys. And we can get things confused in our head about what the, what the truth really is. Um, so some, these are some of the reasons why I get these questions. And I have to say, um, for those in the room and for those of you that are watching at home, when I give this talk in person, I hear so many, I mean, I see so many, whew, visible signs of relief in the audience because actually the fact that we walked all the way upstairs to get our sweatshirt and we get upstairs and we cross the threshold into our room and we can't remember why we're here. We have to go all the way downstairs and back to the room where we decided I need my sweatshirt in order for us to remember that. That is normal aging. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of what you're experiencing is likely normal aging. Um, and let me say this, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but I will also add that there are a number of diseases that have symptoms that mimic symptoms of dementia. Um, so this conversation about what these signs are is very, very important to help people figure out whether or not they should pursue a diagnostic path or seek medical attention or maybe just um, uh, be kinder to their bodies and try to avoid uh, stress in their life as much as possible. And we'll talk about those diseases uh, in a little bit. <clears throat> Um, cognitive impairment, we have already talked about that. Um, signals of cognitive impairment. All right, let's get into the meat of the subject, and I'm going to go back up towards the screen and towards my wheel here. In the book, Appendix A is a pullout guide of this diagram right here. Let me orient you to this diagram. What we're going to talk about now in the meat of our discussion are eight cognitive skills, uh, co cognitive functions, and the skills that they're responsible for. So our cognitive functions are here in this center circle. Don't worry if you can't read them from your seat um, because we will talk about them at length and go through them in a particular order. Um, all of these cognitive functions. The next circle, the center circle here, is the skills that the function is responsible for. And then the outer circle, and we'll talk about all these, 30 different signs of potential cognitive impairment. So for example, um, I think, well, let's, I'm going to give this example out of order, learning. 
If you know anything about dementia, you likely know that uh, dementia, one of the earliest signs of dementia, is short-term memory loss, the inability to recall something that someone just told us a minute ago. When am I going to the dentist? When am I going to the dentist? When am I going to the dentist? Um, so learning, new learning and new memories are formed in the hippocampus. So this function is learning. Um, we talked about new memories. Um, also, uh, the hippocampus is responsible for our wayfinding, our being able to navigate our way to the grocery store, for example. And then also layers of time, separating the layers of time. So when, if dementia is affecting this area of the brain, it's going to make it more likely, areas of my brain, more likely for me to misplace items. I didn't remember where I put them last. Um, repetitive questions, I just gave you an example of that. Getting lost on familiar paths. So going to the grocery store is something that we do on a weekly basis, or if you're like me, more than weekly. Um, and if I all of a sudden couldn't get my way home from the grocery store, then that would be cause for concern um, because Dementia is affecting my wayfinding skills. If I miss appointments, like that dentist appointment, it's it's, it may be because I have difficulty separating the layers of time. If you've ever been in conversation with someone that has dementia and you're having a conversation that's in the present and all of a sudden your loved one or friend um, says something to a person who's been deceased for 10 or 20 years, that's because they're having difficulty separating the layers of time. So this, th that's, talking about the cognitive functions and the skills that uh, each function is responsible for, and then what happens if dementia is affecting uh, those particular skills is what we're going to do uh, for the next probably 30 minutes, maybe less. Positive uh, positron emission tomography. I'm going to use these visuals in this presentation because I think it's very important for us to understand um, exactly what is changing in the brain from a physical standpoint as well as from a skill standpoint. Um, a positive, positron emission tomography, a PET scan, actually scans the brain in slices as do um, other types of scans in the brain. So these particular scans were taken from the same individual. Over on my left is the healthy brain. Um, and I'll talk about what the colors mean in a second. In the center is an early stage scan of this brain in the early stages. And then over on the far right is a scan of this brain in the late stages. We can see the contours of the temple here. Um, and down at the, this is the back of the head, down at the nape of the neck, and, and up at the top of the illustrations is the forehead. So the scan is actually taken horizontal to the earth here. And the different PET scans will scan at different areas of the brain. This scan just happens to be where the temples are discernible. Some scans will be lower and you know, more cheek bound and some will be higher. Um, because this is only one slice of a brain, it, this is not an anatomical drawing at all. It's not intended to tell you exactly where different regions of the brain are located. Why I'm using this, a PET scan measures metabolic activity that's associated with cognitive function. It's not actually measuring cognitive function, but the meta metabolic activity um, that's associated with cognitive function. So. Actually, in a PET scan, we see regions with different colors of the brain representing different layers uh, or different um, levels of activity. Um, there, those, the colors don't actually conform to the exact lobe of the brain. You don't need to worry about that so much. What I want to point out here is the relativity of red tones and yellow tones and orange tones versus purple tones um, and blue tones in each of these um, in each of these diagrams. Have you ever picked up USA Today and looked at the back page of the front section to look at the weather map for all around the country? And let's say the weather map is measuring temperature. Then the hottest areas of the country are going to be dark red, um, and the coolest areas of the country are going to be purple, the opposite end of the spectrum. So the dark red in these illustrations is representative of the areas of the brain where cognitive function is the strongest. Now, I don't know what this person was thinking about or doing during their brain scan, um, but what I want, the, the important part is the relativity from the reds in this area to this scan, sorry, and then to this scan. We see how much cognitive activity is declining 
as we move through from healthy brain to early stage to late stage. There's very little red in this last scan here, indicative of a significant loss of cognitive skill in that person's brain. And when I talk about each of the cognitive functions, we, I, I will highlight for you that area of the brain um, so that you can see, it, it'll be easier for you to see from one scan to the next how activity is diminishing. Uh, so that's my diagram. <clears throat> visual processing. So visual processing, we, we think that we see with our eyes, we don't see with our eyes. Our eyes take in the data, uh, visual data from the world around us. However, it's the occipital lobe down here at the nape of my neck where we actually process what we see. And so that old adage about teachers have eyes in the back of their room or, or in the back of their heads or women have eyes in the back, wives in particular have eyes in the back of their heads. That's really actually true. We actually see with the back of our head. <laughs> so um, the occipital lobe is responsible for processing form, motion, color, light, depth, and it's also the area that governs our peripheral vision. You can try this at home if you want in the room. Be careful um, that you don't uh, slap your neighbor. But if you put your arms out at 180 degrees um, at your sides and you, you wiggle your fingers, um, if you can see your fingers at 180 degrees, you're probably young. I can't see my fingers wiggling um, here on the side of my, of, at, at the far depths of my peripheral vision because my peripheral vision it has been reduced. I have to move my fingers in a little, my hands in a little bit in order to be able to see my fingers wiggling. A 75 year old, it's normal. If this is 180 degrees, a 75 year old, it's normal that they will only be able to see 90 degrees around them. If you've ever wondered why an elderly person turns like this when you call their name and you're standing on their side. It may have to do with arthritis, that's what I always thought it was, or it may have to do with the fact that their peripheral vision is getting reduced. And as a person um, with dementia, um, it goes through their progression of, of the disease, their vision is going to continue to restrict. 75 year old with normal cognitive uh, processes will have restricted vision to 90 degrees. But for people with dementia, that continues to restrict so that they, it's eventually as if they are wearing a scuba mask or a snorkel mask or a ski mask. When you are wearing a ski mask, you have to look down if you want to see the tips of your skis. You can't see them. Your peripheral vision is that restricted. It continues on though, not just from, from ski mask to binoculars and then to monocle. And when, I've got, when I'm wearing a monocle, I have very little depth perception. And through the procession, through the progression of dementia, as the, as the uh, peripheral vision is restricting, depth perception is starting to be affected. So I may, if you've ever seen this, I may reach for my water but think that my water is four inches farther away than it is, and boom, I have spilled my water or coffee or my who knows what. Clumsiness as a result of that visual processing, uh, maybe because, or peripheral vision problems, maybe because of peripheral vision problems. <clears throat> so on the left-hand side is now the bullets that we, the list that we just showed you on the other slide of the cognitive skill that function is responsible for. And on the right-hand side, examples of um, cognitive decline when dementia is affecting that part of the brain. And that, we're visual over here. If you um, are watching this and you actually have a copy of the book, section one down here in the yellow is where we talk about um, these particular functions. So um, if I am having problems detecting form and motion and color, then I may have problems recognizing uh, people's faces. I may have problems recognizing objects for what they are. My father uh, had dementia. I'm twice a family caregiver. My father had dementia. One day I walked into his room and he was attempting to brush his hair with his toothbrush. Object recognition. It had a handle. It had bristles. It was for brushing, but it wasn't the right object. Um, so if someone's having problems with object or facial recognition, that could be cause for concern. Unlike my, my daughter's teacher, remember, because I could recover from that Jan, her name's Jan. If I could never remember, well, that's word loss. Well, it could be facial expression as well. Um, if, I, if I couldn't detect who she was, then that may be cause for concern. 
objects hiding in plain sight. Now some of that could be a result of stress. For example, I was packing to come here today and looking directly at my blue Sharpie for signing books and did not see it <laughs> where it was. My husband said, it's because you're stressed out about the event. Don't worry, you don't have dementia. And he was probably right. <clears throat> Motion blindness. Um, if a person has the, uh, is affected in the occipital area by dementia, then they may not detect objects moving in front of them. This could be very dangerous for someone who is driving because you might notice one car passing by and think it's all right for you to make a right-hand turn without ever realizing there's another car behind the first one that's now approaching the intersection. Um, motion, so motion blindness. Eye trickery and hallucinations. Um, a person with um, dementia may, <clears throat> um, may start when they see their own reflection in a mirror, for example. They may believe that if they are seeing reflections of themselves and other people in a big plate glass window, that those are actually people on the outside uh, looking in, not actually people in the room. They won't be able to figure reflection and shadow and light in the same way that you and I do, um, and which may cause this eye trickery or hallucinations. Also, depth challenge, we talked about reasons for that, and then tunnel vision, and of course that has you know, tunnel vision, that's actually that restricted um, vision. If you are um, working with or inter interacting with a person living with dementia and you know that they are, try to approach them from the front because if their vision is restricted, they may not see you coming from the side and then when you touch them on the shoulder, they had no idea you were in the room, they may startle, they may hit you or worse. Um, so try to make sure that you're approaching um, people from the front if they have dementia. And that's a good idea for any senior because we talked about the fact that there is a loss of peripheral vision in normal aging as well. Um, to call out the, let's see if I can get my pointer to point. Um, so we see here, I've drawn my red bar, my red box around the occipital lobe and we see how little red remains in late stage dementia as compared to when the person's brain was healthy or in early stage dementia even. So that's how my diagrams work, and that's how we'll go through each of these, uh, each of these functions. The next one is linguistic processing. Um, well, there's two here. There's a pair of two here. Um, all auditory processing happens not in our ears, but in our temporal lobes. And linguistic processing, linguistic L, happens in the left temporal lobe and tends to be lost early on in dementia, word loss difficulty having conversation, carrying on conversation. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about the right side and what the right uh, temporal lobe is responsible for in just a minute, but let's stay here on the left side for a minute. So linguistic skill. On the left side of the brain, in the left temporal lobe, that's where my vocabulary is housed. That's where my ability to produce speech that's meaningful is housed. That's where my ability to understand your speech and derive meaning from what you are saying. All of that happens in the left temporal lobe. The left temporal lobe is typically one of the areas um, of the brain that's affected earliest. So word loss is something that may be a sign for, um, uh, of cognitive impairment. Uh, loss of vocabulary, loss of the ability to produce speech, loss of the ability to understand someone else's speech. <clears throat> Seniors in general tend to take more time um, than a 30, 40, or 50 year old to process uh, words in a conversation. Someone living with dementia will take a pronounced amount of time to process what you said and respond back. If you are interacting with a person with dementia, try to allow that time. It's so hard, particularly in society today, uh, and particularly if you're uh, interfacing with a loved one whom you've used to be able to have quick and witty repartee with, um, it's hard to remember to pause and slow down. But to the extent that you can, you will help uh, the person with dementia um, uh, interact and um, enjoy the quality of life through social engagement to greater degree than if you don't. Because if you don't allow that time for processing and they become more frustrated and agitated because of their cognitive difficulties, that will make whatever symptom is displaying worse. Uh, okay, that vocabulary, speech production, and speech comprehension. When there is a cognitive decline in this area associated with dementia, we might notice a significant amount of lost words. And what's interesting is 
the words lost tend to be nouns and pronouns rather than verbs or adjectives or adverbs, which is, I don't know why that is. I have not read any kind of definitive studies that explain that, but it's an interesting um, phenomenon um, because nouns and pronouns um, and, and, uh, are, can be lost. Also, names can be lost here. Um, lost train of thought <clears throat> because the linguistic processing is causing interference that will make someone's ability to get their whole sentence out more difficult. So you, oftentimes you'll see people just stop in mid-sentence and not know how to continue. And it's because of the interference in their brain affecting their ability to produce speech. Slower response times, that's associated with comprehending what you are saying to the person with dementia. And then misunderstandings. Um, misunderstandings often happen because a person has lost certain um, elements of their vocabulary, certain words in their deck, so to speak. Misunderstandings may happen because uh, a person living with dementia, for whatever reason, may only catch three out of every four words that you say. This is why it's sometimes important for you to repeat yourself patiently if you're working with someone with dementia to give them a chance to find the words that they missed the last time you said whatever it was that you said. Uh, so misunderstandings can happen when a person loses one word in the whole sentence that you, um, that you said. In a caregiver situation, I know a story about uh, the wife um, um, of the, the loved one of the person living with dementia. The wife told me the story. Um, her husband was um, in uh, assisted living. Um, he had other family that was coming to visit him that, that, that afternoon that the wife was going to bring. So his male aide was suggesting a shower that he get cleaned up, you know, for the family visit. So the aide is saying to him, your, your, your sisters are coming, you know, this afternoon. How about shower and shave? Let's get all cleaned up, you know, so you look great when your sisters are here. And he's nodding. And so the person living with dementia is nodding too and thinking. And at the end of it, the, the aide says, okay. Well, because we're conditioned to respond to um, facial expressions and gestures and use those as part of our ability to derive meaning, um, the, 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 the person, her husband, thought that, that the aide was just talking about there's going to be people visiting this afternoon, OK? And so he goes, OK. You know, he nods back, responds back. So the aide goes to unbuckle his belt to get him um, undressed for the shower. And the, her husband had no idea that this conversation was about a shower and actually hit the aide because he wasn't getting every single word that the aide was saying. Misunderstandings. <clears throat> oh, I didn't um, point out to you in our rectangle up here, uh, the healthy brain, look at all that activity in the left temporal lobe. It's, it's diminishing over here, though, we see um, as time goes on. And it's diminishing early on. Remember, this is a word loss, linguistic skill loss. It's something that typically happens at the, in the earliest stages of dementia. And I try to say usually and typically as often as possible because it's important to stress that Every case of dementia is as individual as that person's pinky print. We've, you've seen one case of dementia, you've seen one case of dementia. So in my father's case, my father was, um, he was affected by dementia likely in his 30s. I, can, I know in his 40s. Um, he was very conversant until the end. Whereas this is usually, we usually expect that words will be lost early on and the ability to communicate more early than it was. So I try to use, remember to use typically, usually, you may see, um, but if I don't, please try to insert that for yourself because not all cases are the same. Um, that was the left temporal lobe, linguistic skill, lost early. Now we're going to talk about the right temporal lobe, which is where we process rhythmic and sonic auditory data. And it is typically retained, right temporal lobe retained, for a very long period of time in dementia. The um, right temporal lobe is where we process poetry, prayer, song, social chit chat, um, the conversation that I had with Jan, my daughter's teacher. I could have had a lovely conversation with her, 
surface area uh, conversation, not much depth to it, has a rhythm to it. We have inflection. Hey, how's the kids? Oh, I haven't seen you in a while. I know we've been so busy. Yes, life is moving so fast. You know, we do these things at the grocery store and they don't require really a lot from us um, cognitively. That's happening in the right temporal lobe. And oftentimes, because social chit chat is retained, that the rhythm of speech is retained for a long period of time, will say, well, I just saw your father the other day and I didn't notice anything was wrong because that was likely a surface conversation, social chit chat, and the father could get along with that quite, quite handily. However, if you asked the father about current events, um, maybe that conversation wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go so well. Uh, bad, lewd, and mean words. Um, when I was five, I decided to test my mother out, and I used the word damn in a, in a conversation. And she didn't call me out the first time, so I thought, that was weird. So I said it again. A couple sentences later, she didn't say anything. I thought, that was weird. And I mean, I remember this clearly. Uh, it's not normal for a five-year-old to have such a conversation and remember it like this. But then the third time I used the word damn in that conversation, she washed my mouth out. So, <laughs> And so damn went from my left temporal lobe, where vocabulary is, and it gets stored over in the right temporal lobe. We, it's a bad word, so it's not accepted vocabulary, so it doesn't live over here anymore. It lives in the right temporal lobe. And when people lose their vocabulary in the left temporal lobe because they have dementia, they will begin to call on words from the right temporal lobe. So um, if you've ever been in an assisted living setting and you notice that, uh, that uh, a person living with dementia is saying mean things or inappropriate things to the to the the aides or the health workers or to family members it may be because they have lost the vocabulary on the left hand side and all they have to call on is the right hand side um, also when we lose um, um, when we lose the words on the left we will tend to, we have to call on the words from the right. When we lose the words from the left, the words that are left tend to get used more often too. If you have um, you know, iTunes uh, and you, not to name brand names, sorry about that, but if you, have a, if you make a short playlist and you put it on repeat, you hear those same songs over and over and over. If you have a long playlist, you're not gonna hear that same song over and over and over on repeat. So if someone has a long vocabulary list, um, they are probably not suffering from any cognitive impairment. The shorter the list gets, the more often you see the words and the tried and true phrases um, that a person will use. Um, they'll just repeat themselves more or use the same words more and more and more. Um, in cognitive decline, and so we can look over at the right temporal lobe and see actually that there is still some activity over here, even in the late stages of dementia, which is because the right temporal lobe tends to retain its skill much longer. Um, repetitive phrases, I mentioned that a minute ago. Um, most families have tried and true phrases that are shorthand, that um, are usually tied with some story in the past, and sometimes they're, you know, the family jokes, the private jokes, but sometimes it's just shorthand for, oh, uh, well, you know, I know I can apply that situation to this situation, and you don't have to tell me three sentences I know just from those five words that you just used. So we tend to see with people living with dementia, they will rely more on those tried and true phrases than they ever did in the past, and it's because those communicate many, many words with a few words. <clears throat> we will also see misunderstandings occurring because of um, skill retained in the right um, temporal lobe. Um, but lost in the left temporal lobe and people assuming that um, the person with dementia has more cognitive skill or more, more linguistic skill and runs through a conversation too quickly, kind of in the way that I just described. Also, unexpected outbursts may be resulting from those misunderstandings. Um, be, having to do with frustration and anxiety about not being able to process conversation and participate in conversation in the way that one once did. Um, and unexpected outbursts can occur um, verbally or they can be physical violent uh, outbursts. And then also inappropriate language as we've, uh, as we've discussed before. 
executive processing. This happens in the frontal lobe of our brain. Um, we don't have to ever have been an executive. We all do executive processing skills and as part of our daily life. What are examples of executive processing skills? This is my ability to analyze data, to weigh consequences, to form, uh, make decisions and plans based on that data and the consequences of those data. Uh, our ability to execute the plan based on the decisions, based on the data. Um, the ability to analyze how the execution of the plan went and to adjust for later. Also, and these, you know, some of these don't not do not belong kind of game, self-inhibition and empathy also live in this area. Um, that don't have to do with the other activities that we described with, uh, with executive function, but they also come from the frontotemporal lobe. Um, sequencing a task, I skipped that one. We, um, the, how we sequence tasks happens, or that we sequence tasks to get things done happens in the frontal lobe. Um, it, there are a number of steps in even some of the simplest tasks that we perform on a daily basis, like brushing our teeth. Um, that's, I counted that up with a dental hygienist one day, and we came to 34 um, tasks or steps involved in brushing our teeth before we had to stop doing what we were doing and, and go on to our next um, task. So um, a person, so brushing our teeth, grooming, dressing, making the beds, cleaning up the clutter in the house, um, all of these uh, activities require much more sequencing than it, than it appears to the naked eye. And if a person is suffering from cognitive impairment and having experiencing damage in this area, then it's going to be harder for them to groom. It's going to be harder for them to clean up the house. It's going to be harder for them to balance their checkbook. Um, and, and some of those problems have to do with other areas of the brain, and some of them have to do with the simple fact that sequencing um, is not firing the way it, it should be there. Empathy. Empathy is the ability to um, worry about the feelings of others. Um, and self-inhibition is the ability to not say mean things, to hurt the feelings of others. And so coupled with what we talked about in the last um, section, the bad words, the lewd words, the mean words, um, I think all of, oftentimes those episodes are a result of uh, a combination of breakdowns in the brain uh, associated with um, with dementia. It may be that the person has lost the good words to use to communicate, or it may be that they no longer have empathy and don't worry about hurting others' feelings any longer. It could be a combination of those two, or one or the other. Okay, frontal, temper, front, frontal lobe here. So um, I will um, draw my rectangle up to the frontal temporal lobe, and we see dramatic changes over time in the areas of red signaling strong cognitive activity in that area. <clears throat> if we are uh, exhibiting cognitive decline in this area, it's going to be harder for us to make decisions. Um, we will have problems planning. We ha will have problems sequencing tasks, which may also contribute to not being able to get home from the grocery store because sequencing and navigation go hand in hand. Um, uh, this may cause trouble with familiar tasks, not just getting back from the grocery store, but um, for example, so down here in the south, we bake a lot of cornbread. Um, if a person uh, has been used to making the cornbread from scratch uh, for decades and decades, doesn't need the recipe, knows exactly how much flour, how much cornmeal, how much lard, et cetera, and all of a sudden they're forgetting ingredients or forgetting to turn the oven on uh, or forgetting to take the cornbread out of the oven once it's done, that could be signal for um, uh, cognitive impairment associated with the executive processing area of the brain. Um, we talked about inappropriate, be well, we talked about inappropriate language. This might also be inappropriate behavior. Um, frontotemporal dementia is a form of dementia that particularly affects, and very early on, the executive functioning area uh, of the brain. And um, we see a lot of inappropriate behavior, um, usually, if a person is uh, living with frontotemporal um, dementia lots of inappropriate behavior. That could be sexually charged behavior. It could be things that look more like mm, just bad or erratic decisions. Um, there was a, I read an article about a, a prominent physician in Houston who was still um, practicing. He went out one day and bought a helicopter and a hangar um, slot and pilot's license for his helicopter. It was a bad decision. 
Um, he and and it, that wasn't realized. You know, it was thought by some that that was a, maybe a midlife crisis until the pilot got him up in the plane and really understood his cognitive um, function in action and in a very um, high risk scenario, I might add. And then that sort of triggered the conversation about this is. Um, this is, this is something more than midlife crisis or just an erratic decision. I don't want to. I don't want to draw a connection between midlife crises, like buying the red sports car and dementia. I would never want to do that. But if someone is doing something different from before and different for that person, then that may be um, cause for concern. Disregard for other people's feelings. We talked about that one already. Uh, sensory processing. So this occurs in the parietal lobe, which is. Um, under beneath our skull, but kind of in the area where we might wear a yarmulke cap. Um, it's what we, it's how our body detects its presence in space, how we know where we are relative to other objects in the room. Um, it's where we interpret sensation from the body, such as um, chills, uh, hunger. Um, the, the room is too hot, the music is too loud. Um, this is sensory processing. And also our motor planning, um, the ability for me to reach for my water is happening in the parietal lobe. And this is the ability for me to take a sip of my water. <clears throat> when cognitive decline affects this area, um, we may misinterpret touch. We talked about how if someone touches you from the side and you don't know they're there, that may cause you to startle. But this is a little different from that. Um, for a person living with dementia, a simple, gentle caress on the forearm could be misinterpreted as something else. For example, bugs crawling on someone's arm. So if your loved one pulls away from you as you're caressing their arm, that could be very damaging emotionally. And you may not compute that it wasn't the fact that they, didn't, they were resisting your touch, it's that they misinterpreted your touch as something else. Inability to detect pain. A lot of times people will, living with dementia will become um, moody or crotchety, um, or have a lot of agitation for no apparent reason. It may be because they're, they're, they're experiencing pain in their body, but they can't really locate where that pain is in their body. They can't really tell you about it. I have a headache, I have a tummy ache, I have a urinary tract infection, but it's causing their behavior to change. This ended up being a, um, a, a pattern with my father. And by the third time he started um, acting completely not, by, like, not like himself, very mild-mannered man, very genteel. And when he started, I hate to use the word acting out, but when, when the symptoms really started to escalate with him, by the third time that that happened, we knew, okay, this is the urinary tract infection coming back, let's get him on antibiotics. And he was prescribed those before the lab results ever came back because the pattern was consistent uh, with the times before that. Um, in, in, in addition to the inability to detect pain, the body, dementia will eventually cause the body to um, lose the ability to fight infection. And so urinary tract infections, if we think about um, elders are more prone, in general, dementia or not, to need incontinence garments. A person with dementia uh, at some point is likely going to be wearing incontinence garments. And as their dementia progresses, they are likely going to lose the ability to fight infection. And those two combinations together, the incontinence garments and the inability to fight infection, makes UTIs a very common problem. Um, and so we, we see this a lot in memory care units. And then we see the agitation and the um, uh, escalated behaviors that may result from that. And really, it's the person trying to convey, I don't feel well but they don't have the words to do that anymore and they can't really express where the pain is in their body. Um, also, food preferences become limited and this is interesting to me because um, a, a person living with dementia will typically lose the appreciation for savory foods, herbs and spices, um, what we consider to be the entree, but they will retain the ability to process and enjoy the sweet foods, desserts. <laughs> um, we see this a lot um, in memory care units. And typically speaking, a, a good memory care unit will have a lot of ice cream in-house <laughs> for people living with dementia. My father loved Moose Tracks ice cream. Uh, and um, it became a real, it was kind of became a family joke for us. But we always knew if anything else, if everything else failed, Moose Tracks ice cream will bring dad back to dad's, you know, the personality that we're, that we're used to seeing here. I don't know why savory 
uh, savory processing gets lost and why sweet gets retained, but it, it, it does. Um, oh, let me back up for a minute. Here in the parietal lobe, <clears throat> it's a little harder to detect on this slide, this area here, but we see a, a, a great deal less red over here on the right in this area um, than we did in the, in the earlier stages there. Voluntary motion, so sensory motor processing um, is really coming from the same area of the brain, the parietal lobe. Um, the cognitive skills associated with it are responding to sensory stimuli, um, with motion, hand-eye coordination, and our gross and our fine, our fine motor skills. A person living with dementia will typically, every senior's handwriting becomes a little, it changes somewhat and becomes a, a less neat perhaps than it was. It's, some fine motor skill loss is normal. Uh, I should start adding into these slides comparisons between father's, letters that my father wrote me when he was in his 50s and letters that he wrote me when he was in his 80s because, the, first of all, sequencing, the words aren't spelled right, words are missing from the sentence, but you can't, from his handwriting, you can't detect what he was writing about, what he was trying to convey to you. Mumbling and poor enunciation. This is very common with people living with dementia. It has to do with the ability of the, not only choosing the words to get out and being able to get the words out, but moving the mouth in order to get the words out. So mumbling is very common um, and, and poor enunciation. What? What? Speak up. It may not be because the person's trying to not have you understand or hear what they're saying. It may be because they no longer have the ability to the motor skills to communicate as they once did. Trouble with fasteners, um, buttons, shoelaces, zippers, um, neckties. Uh, so we see snaps even. So we see a lot of um, this can affect someone's ability to dress and dress properly because the, they, can't, they can't work the, the fasteners in the way that they once did. And Velcro is God's gift to those living with dementia. It really is. Um, I tried to get my father Velcro shoes before he was ready for them, and he mailed them back to me. And then about a month later, he said, can you get me those shoes? I really need those shoes now, because he, he could no longer tie his own shoes. And shuffling with walking, this is also very common. Not a foregone conclusion that this, is, that this will happen, but people with dementia, because the, their fine motor, I mean, their gross motor skills are um, declining. They do not have the ability to pick up their feet as they, the same way that you and I do. And they're also their gait changes, it becomes much shorter. And this is dementia. It's not arthritis, it's not old age, it's the dementia. Um, and this is a, an aside, but I'll, I'll say it now. I learned later than I would have liked to learn when um, a person with dementia, when you're walking them to the cafeteria to get the cup of coffee or what have you, at a certain point in their dementia, they will lose the ability to do two things at once. And so at some point, my, you know, I'm desperate for the cup of coffee <laughs> as the family caregiver. I want, you know, some, uh, some kind of something um, for, to stimulate my body. So I'm desperate. So we're trying to get to the cafeteria. But I keep asking my father questions to, tr to try to make conversation. It's a long walk to the cafeteria. Every question, we're walking along. He's walking slowly. He's shuffling along. I ask him a question. He stops dead in his tracks, has to think about what I said has to think about the answer, has to get the answer out. And I'm thinking, coffee, 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 coffee. Anyway, and so eventually I learned, just don't talk to him when he's walking. Just get to the cafeteria, sit down, then have the conversation. Uh, OK, new learning and new memory. This brings us back to the beginning. Um, there are, are two parts here in the limbic system, which is in the medial temporal lobe, that we're going to talk about. We talked briefly in the beginning about new learning and new memories. <clears throat> uh, um, the limbic system is, has multiple functions to it. Two of the main ones, at least, as far as conversation about dementia, um, have to do with self-preservation. We talked about self-preservation in the very beginning. Uh, the limbic system um, houses the hippocampus. This is our self-preservation by adaptation. This is where we learn. We preserve ourselves by learning, whether it's directions you know, to wherever we need to go in order to get whatever it is we need to get to self-preserve, or whether it's, it's learning um, that someone is upset. And because they are very important to us, we, we, um, we now I've lost my train of thought. 
I'll move on. It usually comes back. <laughs> anyway, intentional adaptation. Um, this is where we form new memories and new learning. Uh, it is in charge of our immediate recall, so that when are we going to the dentist? Oh, right, you just told me we're going to the dentist at 3 o'clock, sorry. Versus when are we going to the dentist? When are we going to the dentist? When are we going to the dentist? Um, so uh, control over stored memories also occurs here, and our sense of time and place. Bless you. If we have loss of cognitive skill in this area, um, it will affect our ability to adapt to change. So let's say I always play bridge at 1 o'clock on Wednesdays um, with my girls. Been doing that for tens of years. Now all of a sudden I find on Monday that for whatever reason, not having bridge at 1 o'clock on Wednesday this week. Now, you and I might be able to, probably will be able to say, oh darn it, I was really looking forward to that. Well, what am I going to do on you know, midday and Wednesday? I'll go for a walk. I'll go to the park. I'll go to the mall. We figure out a plan B. We might be upset we didn't get to see our friends this week, but we'll be able to move on. If a person is living with dementia, they will not be able to formulate a plan B. They will not be able to recover from that disappointment. They will not be able to move on. They will become agitated because their plans changed, and they didn't want their plans to, to change. People with dementia, because they are losing, we talked about losing the ability to process visual data, visual data, auditory data, tactile data, um, emotional data, have conversations. Because a person is losing those abilities to interpret and respond to the world around them, self-preservation, interpreting and responding to the world around them and potential threats that may be occurring, they are going to, um, generally speaking, live in a state of higher anxiety than you and I. Anxiety and stress will become a default mode. For us, that's unfortunate when it happens, but it's probably not our default mode. Living in that higher um, anxiety area, constantly, 24-7, there are going to be, people with dementia tend to be easier to agitate. And so this inability to adapt to change um, can cause system, symptom, escalation. A person living with dementia, because they have de decreased ability to interpret and respond to the world around them, um, they will um, easily become agitated. They will easily feel threatened. They will easily, um, their, their symptoms can, can easily escalate. Um, they are, I'm continue to lose what I wanted to say to you, and I hope I recover from it, because you know why I hope I recover from it. Um, it's the stress. <laughs> um, <clears throat> problems following directions and wayfinding will show up if a person has um, decline in this area. Difficulty retaining new data. Um, re also asking repetitive questions, which we talked about before, misplacing things, um, like a wallet. If you can't find it, you know, we all need money. We need our phone, we need our keys, we need our wallet to get along in this world. If we can't find these things, we might, and we feel threatened by that, then we might put them in safer and safer places. But the problem is we don't remember the safe place because it's a new learning. Um, you and I can typically recover from that, but a person living with dementia will um, continue to lose their wallet, not be able to find it, and then in order to explain that, they will need to accuse someone else of um, uh, of stealing their wallet. So we'll see accusations and misunderstandings occur a lot and missed appointments as well um, in this area of the brain. Uh, the other side of survival is um, survival by defense, the fight or flight mechanism. Um, this is where um, this also happens in the um, uh, in, the, in the limbic system, it happens in a different area from the hippocampus. Um, the hippocampus is new learning. The amygdalae is this fight or flight response. It is this, I'm going to defend myself physically rather than adapt to change. I will defend myself. Um, and so this is where we detect and respond to threat. This is also, one of these does not belong again, where we form emotions and where our pleasure-seeking centers uh, are in, in the brain. And if a person is living with dementia and they are aware that they are no longer able to respond to the world around them and meet their own needs autonomously, then they will become, uh, they will have a, an increased sense of urgency because now they rely on other people more. They can't, I know what it was I was gonna say before, I'm sorry, let me say it before I forget. Um, I did recover 
as promised, familiar. A person living with dementia, because um, they're not processing the same way they used to, nothing seems familiar anymore. The more familiarity we can give, a, provide for a person living with dementia, the better um, their quality of life, the less agitated they will become. There are new, I won't name any names, but a lot of new um, assisted living facilities will have a memory care unit, or the whole campus is designed in these popular monochromatic color schemes today. Um, uh, 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 that, and in some of them, the memory care unit rooms are pre-furnished. I think this is a bad idea. A person moving, inability to detect and respond to the world around them, is moving from a familiar place where they've lived for 30 years into another f place that's completely unfamiliar with unfamiliar furniture now that's going to cause a lot of agitation. Um, so to the degree that we can provide familiarity, if you move a loved one into assisted living, bring their tchotchkes, bring their artwork, bring their um, whatever little items you can that will fit in that space so that they feel um, a more familiar uh, environment around them. And if you're, if you're having a loved one move in with you, please try to avoid a monochromatic um, uh, color scheme because a person, you know, color, detecting of color, we talked about that with, uh, in the occipital lobe, visual processing can't necessarily find a commode in an all-white bathroom with white fixtures and white tile and white walls and white towels. So we want to make sure that we don't, um, that we have lots of uh, chromatic diversity in the room so that people can find the objects that they're looking for. Okay, sorry, digression about familiarity being important. <clears throat> Survival by, def uh, by defense here. Detecting and responding to threat. Um, forming an emotions and, and pleasure seeking. When this area of the brain is hit, and um, interestingly enough, looking at these two red dots, which I um, believe represent the amygdala um, in the early stages, hmm, they seem to become bigger in the early stages of dementia. Hmm. This seems to be the area of the brain where most activity, cognitive acti activity, excuse me, is happening in the late stages of the disease. And so the amygdala is driving, the emotions are driving, the ability for rational thought, reasoning is usually lost by this time, and it's emotions driving. And that's why we get this urgent, these urgent needs. I, I feel threatened and I feel um, in danger because I can't get the moose tracks ice cream myself, or I can't fasten my own clothes, or I have a urinary tract infection. So it's very common that the anxiety levels that we already talked about will escalate as the amygdala take over and end up in the driver's seat over time. Heightened sense of urgency is a result of this. Inability to delay gratification. Where's my moose tracks ice cream? Um, distrust, paranoia, and delusions. Also overreaction, um, and then aggression. Uh, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Aggression, agitation, combativeness, and anxiety for the reasons that, that we talked about. So that, we see, I did it again. The amygdala driving, the, the big red um, dots in the center of that brain where there is relatively little uh, cognitive um, function happening in other areas of the brain. I have a couple more slides. Do we have time for a couple more slides? We're, we've, we've run over a little bit here. <clears throat> Establishing a cognitive baseline. Back to the beginning. Uh, I was saying that it's because the changes in dementia happen so very slowly, so gradually, it's so difficult to discern from one day to the next if there is a problem happening. And because we're forming a new normal every day as, as we're interacting with a person who may be living with cognitive decline, it's, and we're forming that new normal every day, it becomes hard to remember and be clear on what was that person like six months ago. So it's very important to establish a cognitive baseline. This is a snapshot of a moment in time, but it's much easier when we have the before picture to look at the subsequent after pictures and compare and contrast and see, is this a problem we should be worried about or is this more examples of normal aging? Uh, establishing a cognitive, uh, cognitive baseline. If you are 65 or older, uh, Medicare pays for um, the a cognitive assessment during your annual wellness visit. The vast majority of physicians, 90 plus percent, know of this. They know that they should be performing this um, during the annual wellness visit. But surprisingly, it actually occurs 40, only 40 or 50 percent of the time. 
for reasons that could be multiple. You know how the doctor's office is a churn in today's um, you know, healthcare system. And so the doctor only has a certain number of minutes with you and will also be needing to talk about other uh, physical um, uh, issues or opportunities or successes that you may be having. Um, people don't know necessarily that they should advocate for themselves and ask if the doctor doesn't bring it up, um, him or herself. Um, so it doesn't happen nearly as often as it should. I, without making commentary on the healthcare system um, or editorial about that, I would just encourage everyone to advocate for themselves and their spouses and to try to make sure that this screening does happen. It's free, it should happen, and this is the baseline. Um, that that later uh, visits can compare to to really identify whether or not the changes are normal or something more serious. Um, uh, we talked about all of that. Seeking medical advice. Um, I want to. I'm not going to show you any more slides. Uh, I just wanted to circle back to something that I said in the very beginning, which is about the fact that um, there are symptoms that we talked about here. Also could be instead symptoms of some other medical condition that may be treatable. Depression is one that will share symptoms with dementia. So one of the earliest um, uh, uh, activities on the diagnostic path would be a screening for depression. Um, hypothyroidism, cardiac uh, problems, diabetes, um, uh, endocrinology problems, um, uh, vitamin deficiencies, the interaction of certain drugs in combination, all of these and other medical conditions may cause symptoms that look like dementia but are not. If something is treatable and can restore health or improve health to improve or restore maximum quality of life, we would probably want to engage in a diagnostic path um, to identify what that was um, and to get that treated. So when people say to me, I have clients that say to me, I'm really dreading this conversation. I've really seen changes in my husband, and I know we need to get this checked out. I think he's going to resist me. He's not noticing what I'm noticing. The approach might be, you know, you and I are, seem to be having more misunderstandings than we used to, right? Because linguistic skills tend to be lost early. Um, we, you, we're having more misunderstandings than, than um, than, than we used to. And I'm wondering, it might be our hearing, let's go get our hearing checked. Or you seem kind of depressed, let's go, let's, let's look into this, you know, let's treat this for your quality of life. Not ever mention the big D word. Let's go check out, you know, this one thing that I'm noticing. And in the process of the diagnostic path, we may indeed identify hearing aids are the answer. Or we may identify this is a, a hormonal issue, let's adjust, you know, your, um, your thyroid medication or what have you. Um, or, or, or through that process, we, we may discover it's not the hearing, it's not the thyroid, it's not um, any of these other uh, issues that share symptoms with dementia. But during that diagnostic path of seeing numerous specialists, a person living with dementia will have the opportunity to come to their own realization rather than being told they have a cognitive issue. Because as humans, anytime we can come to our own realization about something, it always goes better, right? <laughs> than being told something and not wanting to accept that. So if there is an issue, Indeed, I encourage a diagnostic path, but not the conversation about, let's not jump to, gosh, this could be dementia. Let's jump to, let's go see what this is and see if we can treat it. And that is where I will leave our conversation. Do we have time for some questions? Are there any questions in the room? Anything that you hoped I'd cover but didn't? So are you saying, as you teach us, uh, that cognitive, it, when dementia begins or is developing, it, it doesn't, all parts of the brain and all of these areas are, don't necessarily deteriorate at the same rate? Yes, and I'm glad you brought this question up. Um, Denise asked, um, do all these or don't all these areas of the brain deteriorate at the same rate? And indeed they do not. Um, and every person's form of dementia is different. I'm so glad you asked this question because there's something that I should have said but didn't, which is, all of these 30 signs that we talked about, a person doesn't have to have all 30 signs in order for there to be cause for concern. A person could have just one sign and it's cause for concern, but it may not be dementia. And certainly 
as we mentioned before, not all of these signs will show up for everyone, and they will not show up in the, I didn't really lay them out in, the, in, the, in, an, in a particular order, but some may never show up, and some things that we typically consider to be early signs may not show up until very late, like my father's linguistic skills stayed for a long, long, long time afterwards. Thanks for that question. Other questions in the room? Have you uh, noticed some signs in yourself and thought, oh, gosh, I'm so glad to know that's normal? Oh, very much so. OK. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to alleviate your concerns. A lot of people ask that. And oftentimes, I, I find that when I ask, well, what's going on in your life? Oh. You know, I hear about all of these stress-producing mm -hmm. activities and thoughts and concerns, and very commonly, it's stress or lack of sleep or lack of, um, of proper nutrition. Um, so I'm glad that I've alleviated some fear. I hope I've alleviated some fear uh, online as well about uh, things you may be noticing, changes uh, in yourself or a loved one. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really, really excellent, and appreciate your coming. I know that uh, this will be on the library's YouTube channel for our guests to watch and a resource that we will have forever and ever. And I think it's an incredibly important talk. And for me personally, it connected all of these dots as I cared for my grandmother. Um, it just all makes a whole lot more sense. And so I appreciate it. So again, the book is The Dementia Field Guide. And feel free to come up and, and talk to, um, to Cloud over here at her desk. And thank you on behalf of Gwinnett County Public Library. Thank you, Cloud. Thank you very much. Thank you.